welcome to Good Game Spawn Point, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Barjo. And I'm Hex. And I am Dadum. Coming up on the show, we break a lot of very expensive and precious things in dangerous golf. Fuck. Four. Who knew golf could be so destructive? I've got a small golf course in the Darren Cave. I practice quite regularly. What? You've got a whole course back there? Why have you never invited us? Yeah. Oh, there's a uh, strict uh, policy for the club. No biological beings allowed. Oh, except for Goose. He makes a fine caddy. Ooh, now this is a tricky one. What would you suggest, Goose? Ah, uh, well, Darren, the eighth hole is a bumpy par four. It's over a couple of water hazards and a sand trap, so I'd suggest the nine iron. Ah, excellent suggestion. There we are, sir. Oh, 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 oh. oh good shot, Darren. Uh, oh, apart from those other golfers. Four! Oh! Let's get out of here. <laughs> oh, affirmative. Robots enslaving humanity, Barjo. It's happening sooner than we think. Well, while we're still in charge, Darren, how about you give us another one of your challenges? Oh, it'd be my pleasure. Cycle up your synapses, Spawnlings, because it's time for Darren's Challenge! <laughs> Today, I'm asking you this. What is the name of Kirby's home planet? Answer at the end of the show. Mm, I'm not sure, but I bet it's round and pink. All right, well, now it's time for some gaming picks with Goose. Hey, what's up, Goose? Goosey! Goosey! Hi guys! Darren, tremendous round on the links earlier. However, I think your short game needs a bit of work. Well, if you polished my clubs properly, we wouldn't have this problem now, would we? Trouble on the course. Oh, Darren, I'll have you know I caddied for my vacuum cleaner the other week and it played a perfect round, so I think the problem's with you. Alright guys, time to move on for my picks for this week. And first up, the new legendary Pokémon for Pokémon Sun and Moon have been announced. There's Solgaleo, a sort of lion-type creature who has steel and psychic abilities, as well as resistance to stat-altering effects. And then there was Lunala, a creepy bat type of thing with psychic and ghost abilities. And speaking of new Pokemon, we've been getting some excellent submissions to my Create Your Own Pokemon Challenge. Let's have a look at a few. Some excellent work in there, and a shout out for Zach's Glaciad. I particularly like how you detailed all the evolutions there. I'm not sure what to think about Luke's ultimate hamster though, because you did submit it without using original artwork, but still, thanks for sending it in. Of course, that's just a taste of some of the great work you've been doing, and submissions are still open. So if you've got an idea for your own Pokemon and want a chance to win some sweet spawn point loot, then you can go here and submit your creations. Now, back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Goose. Uh, Barjo, Hex, do you remember the Coding Corner segment from last year that Goose hosted with our young programmer friend Julian? Of course, Darren. We learnt a lot about the basics of coding watching those. Well, we still get a lot of email from spawnlings who are interested in getting started on making their own games and learning to code. Oh, sounds like Goose and Julian should work on some new lessons for this year. Indeed. In fact, I thought now would be a good opportunity to take a look at some of the great coding tools that are available, because there are a lot of potential starting points for beginners. Mm, good idea, Darren. You know, I always think that Scratch is a great place to start for beginners. Oh, affirmative, Barjo. Scratch was created at the famous Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. It runs right in your browser at the official Scratch website. There's no scary looking code, instead you arrange colour coded interlocking blocks. Each of these blocks tells the computer to do something, like make a sound or move a character when you press a button. If you're keen to learn but feel a little bit intimidated by how complex game code looks, well Scratch is a great place to start. Another great way to get into coding is Python. Python is a programming language, which just means it's a way for humans to express ideas in a way that machines can understand. Python is one of the most widely used languages in the world. Instagram, Pinterest and Reddit were all made with Python, and Google makes heavy use of it too. Python is very powerful, but it's also quite easy to learn. A great tool for getting started with Python is Pygame, an add-on geared towards making games quickly and easily. There are loads and loads of free guides online, and Python itself is free. Starting with a free program to see if coding is your thing is always a good idea. And don't forget about Raspberry Pi, Darren. This is a Raspberry Pi. It's a credit card size computer that costs... It's a cheap but very powerful little home computer that can be used for all sorts of coding. 
Yeah, you can run it on a normal TV, and not only is it perfect for learning Python on, it's also great for making projects with electronics and robotics. If you don't already have a proper Windows PC or Mac at home, then Raspberry Pi could be a great option. Oh, then there's Game Maker. Game Maker is an Integrated Development Environment, or IDE, which means it's a complete program that has all the tools you need to put together finished games. And it's actually fairly easy to get into, and many primary schools now teach courses on Game Maker. But it's also powerful enough to make high-quality games. For instance, Risk of Rain, which we reviewed recently, was made using Game Maker. And then if you were interested in something even more advanced, you could look into something like Unity. Unity is an IDE with huge potential that is also relatively easy to learn. While Game Maker is geared more towards making 2D games, Unity can be used to make flashy 3D games like Crossy Road and Ukulele. Unity is now taught in many high schools across Australia, so if you feel comfortable with Game Maker or Python, don't be afraid to jump in and give it a go. There are literally dozens of IDEs and programming languages to choose from, and most of them are perfectly good ways to learn coding. But there's another factor you should consider when picking a language or IDE, and that's popularity. Ah, yes. Remember Project Spark? It was basically Microsoft's answer to Little Big Planet. It worked well enough, but one day Microsoft decided they didn't want to pay to support it anymore, so they pulled the plug. And that means that not only are the tools gone, but the community too. Uh, but the good thing is, Python, Unity and Game Maker are all widely used by the video game industry. That's right, Darren. I think it's safe to say that they're going to be around for years and years. It's unlikely that the rug's going to get pulled out from under you on those ones. Affirmative. Uh, but computing is still evolving rapidly. Over time, languages and systems fall in and out of favour. People who code for a living usually learn several languages over the years to stay up to date. Yeah, there's just so much going on. It's a really great time to be interested in game making. And if you want a head start, then there's nothing stopping you from downloading the free version of the programming tools that interest you and having a bit of a tinker. Affirmative. We look forward to seeing what you create. Yeah, and I can't wait to see some more coding lessons with Goose and Julian. They should totally have a look at Game Maker. Yes. Oh, affirmative. Uh, but now it's time for you two to go to the Ask Spawn Point desk. Hurry, the Spawnlings need your help. OK, let's get some questions answered, Bajo. And first up, we have this one from the Virtual Reality King, who is in VR land in South Australia. Oh, your Virtual Highness. Mm. Hi, GGSP. Just wondering, do you know when Microsoft HoloLens will be released and what will it cost? If you do not answer, I will throw you in my Virtual Reality Pit of Doom! P.S. Bajo is awesome. And Darren is a noob. P.P.S. Darren is a mega noob. Bajo, do these as... I am... Ah, yes. Well, firstly, we should point out your virtual reality, Highness, <laughs> that the HoloLens isn't a virtual reality handset. It's what's called augmented reality. Yeah, the difference being that a virtual reality headset completely closes off the real world to immerse you in a virtual one. Yeah, while augmented reality actually uses your surroundings and puts images or holograms into them. Similar to stuff you might have seen on phones like the upcoming Pokemon Go, for example. And even stuff like Kinect and iToy games use augmented reality, and if you've ever had a 3DS, you might have played with the augmented reality stuff that comes with that, too. But sadly, we don't know when the HoloLens is due to come out or how much it will cost. What we do know is there is a special development kit that's available now, which costs about 4000 Australian dollars to buy. Although, development kits do often cost a lot more than the retail versions, so chances are the retail one will be a fair bit cheaper than that. Even so, I think it will still be quite expensive. I'd guess it will be at least $1,000 and probably more than that. Well, uh, but from what we've heard, the plan is for the first versions of HoloLens to be targeted targeted more towards businesses and things like museums or schools rather than for people to play games on at home. And based on what Microsoft have said, seems likely we'll probably see the first retail version available sometime next year. And then over the next few years, providing it's successful, we'll no doubt see cheaper versions come out aimed more towards gamers. Hmm. Alright, well let's move on now to this one from Maccus, who is in Melbourne, uh, which is in the ACT apparently. Hmm. Must have moved. Hmm. Yeah. Hi, good game. In Scrap Mechanic, how do you get a car to work? Please answer. Well, Maccus, it can be a little bit tricky to get a car working, but once you understand the basics, it's not too hard. So to build a basic car, first things first, put down your lift 
then build out whatever shape you want your car to be with some blocks. Next, add your driver's seat and engine. Then you'll need to put a few little legs onto your car's body to attach the wheels to. But for your front legs, you'll need to put a pair of bearings between each of them and the main body. This will let you actually turn those wheels and steer your car, which is quite important. Next, you'll have to put four bearings on each of your legs to attach your wheels to. Now all that's left to do is use the connect tool to bring it all together. So firstly, connect your engine to your driver's chair, then connect the driver's chair to the front two bearings. This lets you control those and steer. And finally, connect the engine to your bearings on your wheels to power them, and then make sure that each of those is set to rotate the right way. And now just get rid of the lift, jump in the driver's seat, and away you go! Of course, that is just one very basic design, and if you want, you could actually power just the back two wheels, or why not make some crazy 20 wheels thing, or put jets on it, <gasps> or you could build some kind of walking machine. Oh. So feel free to experiment with making any kind of vehicle you can imagine. Well, good luck with that, Marcus. Uh, let's move on to this one now from the Skylander King, oh, who is in Sydney, New South Wales. <laughs> hey, guys! Can you answer or I will unleash my Skylander army upon you? Will Skylanders will have another game after Superchargers? Thanks, GGSP. P.S. You guys are amazing and no one is a noob. Well, thanks for the kind words, Skylander King. <laughs> and we're happy to report that this year's new Skylanders game has officially been announced. Yes, and it's going to be called... Skylanders Imaginators. And this time you'll be able to build and design your very own Skylander in the game and then store them in a special crystal. And it's set to come out in October on just about every console. Even the old PS3 and 360 will still be getting it. Mm. All right, well, let's move on to this one now. Oh, it's a complaint. Uh, it's from Floop the Pig, a.k.a. Maxon, who is in Perth, Western Australia. Well, floop's fun to say. Floop, floop, floopity floop. Yeah, it's almost like a verb, isn't it? Mm. Like, what is it to floop? Mm, today, I flooped. Will I floop tomorrow? That remains to be seen. <laughs> oh, it could be like a kind of dance. Yeah, the floop. What would yeah. that look like? Oh, yeah. I feel like it's just like wild. Like, I'm flooping. Do the floop floop. Hi, GGSP. I'm afraid I have a complaint. After I explain, everyone must drink a special mixture from the Noob Cup. The mixture has to include plain rice, milk, ice cream and raw bacon. A spawn link sent you a message in episode 15 this year and told you that she slash he could not make a nether portal and you said it was possible. It is not. It is impossible to make one and travel into the nether. Instead, you must make a nether reactor. The nether reactor will include 14 cobblestone, 4 gold blocks and 1 nether reactor core. You must drink from the noob cup! Oh man, I don't want to drink from the noob cup. Besides, that was Darren's mistake. Why should we be punished for his mistake? Yeah, well, why don't we just call Darren? I'm sure he can explain everything away and we won't have to drink from it anyway. Good point, Hex. He always gets out of this kind of stuff. Yeah. It's ringing. Good ringtone this week. <laughs> yeah, not bad. Hello. Darren, how's it going, mate? Oh, hello, Marjo. Hi. Can I help you? Well, as the Sportling here says that you were wrong about getting to the Nether in Minecraft Pocket Edition. They say that it's not possible to get there and instead you need to use a Nether Reactor. Well, clearly this Sportling simply has not updated their game for a while. Oh. The Nether is most definitely possible to get to in the Pocket Edition. If you need proof, watch this. Meanwhile, the Nether Reactor was actually removed from Alpha version 0.12.1. The Nether Reactor was simply meant to be a substitute when there was no way to actually get to the Nether. But since they added it in, the Reactor was removed. I'd suggest they update their game to the latest version and see for themselves. Mm, well, that seems pretty rock solid, Darren. <laughs> so I guess that means we're in the clear on that one. Thank you. Uh, okay. Bye, bye, Darren. Bye. Catch ya. All right, well, I think we have time for one more quick question today. So let's go with this one from the Whale Lord, uh, who is in Sydney, New South Wales. Lord of Wales. Whale Lord. It was a whale of a time, being the Whale Lord. What do you do as a Whale Lord? I'm lord of all these whales. I imagine you just ride a whale. Oh, yeah. Organise little whale gatherings. the ocean. Little music and parties. Make, yeah, whale noises. Yeah. <laughs> Drop the bass. <laughs> Drop the bass, Darren. <laughs> hey, GGSP. I was wondering if the new Nintendo NX will still have all of the Wii U games, because if it doesn't, I will self-destruct. Hex to these. <laughs> Well, well, Lord, 
Uh, we don't know if the NX will support Wii U games, but we do know that every Nintendo console since the GameCube has been backward compatible with the console before it. So the Wii could play GameCube games, and the Wii U could play Wii games, so I'd say chances are good that the pattern will continue, and the NX will play Wii U games. Well, we don't know that for sure, though, and the Wii U may be tricky to support due to a lot of games needing the gamepad, so unless the NX has a similar sort of controller or can support the gamepad, then it may be hard for it to play Wii U games. Mm, we'll just have to wait and see for the official announcement before we know for sure, won't we, Hex? Mm, indeed we will. On that note, though, we're out of time for this week, but if you'd like to ask us something, then you can go here and send it in. Shall we go back to studio? Let's do it. Darren, whale noise us out. <coughs> do the flip dance. Tasty Plankton. Once upon a time, there was a golf ball. On the surface, it seemed to be a completely normal ball. A humble piece of sporting equipment, ready for use on the green. But when placed in a small room, filled to the brim with delicate objects, the ball took on another purpose. It became an evil tool of ultimate destruction. <laughs> Hang on a sec, Darren. Are you talking about the video game Dangerous Golf? Affirmative. <laughs> Dangerous Golf is not just a golf game. It's a destruction simulator. Your job is to shoot a golf ball off and then guide it and putt it through a room until you've destroyed as much as you can. That's right, Hex. And despite what Darren says, I don't think the ball is actually evil. <laughs> That's just what it wants you to think. But it sure does cause a lot of destruction. This game is all about reveling in the joy of smashing stuff into itsy bitsy bits. You'll be putting over a variety of locations around the world. There's kitchens full of plates, frying pans and soup, cellars full of bottles and barrels, there are also toilet cubicles to crash into and petrol stations to blow up. And my personal favourite, this elegant dining hall with the piano and statues, which you crash into and blow up. These rooms are designed in a way that begs you to wreck everything. <laughs> and it's quite sophisticated how objects fall apart when you smash through them. It's strangely satisfying watching plates fall to the ground and shatter and microwaves explode. And all the while watching those dollar signs stack up, hoping that you've caused enough mayhem to unlock the next level. If you don't, it's try, try again. Perhaps aiming for new angles or a destruction strategy. Yeah, for example, at one point I discovered you could shoot back into the fourth wall and get a bit of a height boost when you need it. The idea of destroying a room is fairly straightforward, but as much as I like the chaos, and I do like the chaos, uh, the way the game has been put together is confusing and sloppy. Uh, for example, you're told which buttons you have to press in the loading screens, but then when the game starts, you have to remember them. This would normally be fine, but these controls are unusual. Yeah, I agree, Darren. The controls are a bit awkward. You have to flick the left stick forward to send the ball flying, and then you have no control over where it goes. Then, if you've destroyed enough objects, your ball can go on fire, which lets you shoot it off again and allows you to guide it through the room. It's pretty exciting when you manage to get some good combos and cascades of broken items, but a lot of it just feels random. Yeah, there is a lot of luck involved. Too much, really. And once you've angled into a few pots or walls, you tend to feel like there's not much more you can do about the rest of your on-fire time. Then you need to pop the ball into a final hole, and sometimes it seems utterly impossible because you've landed in the wrong spot. And then other times it goes in without any skill required at all. Like magic. Even for a silly smashing game like this, there needs to be some skill involved. Mm. I understand that the developers are trying to make the putting less about accuracy and more about fun, but in the end you just end up doing too much trial and error, which does not feel rewarding. Yeah, it's a good point, Darren. It's rare that you feel like you've done a good job. Even when you get a gold or platinum medal or perform some of the seemingly random signature moves, it still feels like you didn't earn it. Guys, I have some issues with the financial economics of this world. I do not believe plates cost this much. That's a lot of money. 
And why does missing a hole cost you tens of thousands of dollars? That punishment seems unfair. Hmm, I struggle with what I should be prioritising to destroy. I mean, you do get hints, but it's still quite tricky to look around this room and work out what will cost the most, or which kind of ricochets will be possible. I want to be able to plan out angles and watch things blow up together in huge chain reactions. Because in similar games we've played before, that was key to the enjoyment, whereas this feels a little bit more like a tech demo. We don't know this for sure, but it's hard not to think that the developers made these levels as a test and then tried to make a game out of it. And the levels, while set in countries like France, the US and Australia, are not representative of those countries either. That's right, Darren. Where are the kangaroos? Yeah, or the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, or French Perth. I think you guys are right. This does feel like a tech demo with menus. This needed more time on polish and testing. The mechanics of things like money flags aren't explained well, and there isn't enough interaction with environmental elements like fire and water. And that could have caused some fun chain reactions. And on top of all that, sometimes the camera locks in position and doesn't show you all the destruction that you're causing. That's the whole point of the game. Another reason we're being quite negative about this game is that it's quite expensive for what you get. And if you're playing on PC, it appears you can only officially use it with an Xbox One or Xbox 360 controller. There's no keyboard support, which is pretty strange considering how simple the controls are. That's my biggest issue with this game, Hex. I want to be able to swing a golf club in a golf game, or have some mechanic to measure power, angle, or a timing minigame. These are things that almost all golf games have and are strangely missing here. Oh, but we should wrap this up. What are your final thoughts? This is pretty disappointing overall. I'm giving it one and a half out of five rubber chickens. Yeah, I was really looking forward to this, but I did not have much fun, so I'm giving it one out of five rubber chickens. Well, we're just about out of time for this week, but Darren, could you please give us the answer to your challenge? Affirmative! At the start of the show, I asked you this. What is the name of Kirby's home planet? And the answer is... Planet Popstar! Hmm, funny you should mention Kirby and planets, Darren, because next week in the show we're reviewing the new Kirby game, Planet Robobot. <laughs> And Darren, you and I will be reviewing that one since, Bajo, you're going to be off to the E3 Expo in Los Angeles. That's right, Hex. I'm so excited to play all the latest games and see all the latest consoles and speak to some of my favourite developers. Now, Bajo, usually I would go with you, but this year I thought I might send Goose along. He's never been and it'll be a great experience, so I hope you'll look after him. After all, I'm still apprehensive about sending you two humans to do a robot's job. Uh, a goose! Goose! Goosey! Uh, oh, hey, guys! I can't wait to get over to E3. I'm so excited! Mm, how's the, uh, how's the packing going? Well, uh, I've got my undies, I've got my socks. Uh, uh, that's everything, right? Uh, now, Barjo, Goose, I've set up a fail-safe support system just in case things go wrong. Underneath your seats, you will find a phone. Please take that with you and you'll find it is a direct support line to me. Darren, I don't know about this. It's pretty heavy. You know, I think we'll be fine without them. Yeah, they seem pretty cumbersome. Now, now, these are far more secure than normal mobile phones. They're equipped with GPS, an alarm and snacks should you go hungry. They are a complete life support system. Oh, well, thanks very much, Darren. All right, well, until next time, Spawnlings, goose out. Sarjo out. Hex out. Darren out. Darren, have you been fiddling with these? It says here laser conduit. What does that mean? Oh, oh I probably won't have to use that. It's uh, just a precaution. OK. I'm concerned.